SNL very well. About 85% uh, of the SNL were losing money by 1992. So this, uh, you know, if we ignore you, you're going to grow out of it, wasn't quite working. But because of this tax law, they had the incentive to keep this going. As long as the tax uh, benefits were in place, the investors wanted to buy real estate. Uh, the lenders were making good money, loan officers were doing deals, commissions were big. Uh, developers, as long as a developer can get money, a developer will build. And then the appraisers were looking for a job. And I can tell you when I was an appraiser, we were just looking for the next job. So everybody wanted to keep it going. But then the regulators finally said we're going to start looking again, which comes back to my point about I don't really understand the regulators. And they said, well, let's just, you know, everything we did, we're undoing. You know, we're, going to, we're going to change it all back to, to the way it was. But the damage had already been done, and so you had this massive overbuilding. building. Well, the only data set that I've ever found that goes back pre-90s, back into the 80s, is CoStar for the Dallas office market. So their data actually goes back to 1982. And so what you're looking at here is, if you look at the top under the title, in the beginning of 1982, Dallas-Fort Worth had 92 million square feet of office space. In the next six years, 82 to 88, they added 89 million. They almost doubled it in six years. So the mid-80s, all of a sudden, Texas gets hit with the oil price collapse. I told you I wasn't in real estate. In the 80s, I was in oil and gas, which was not necessarily a good thing, but that's where I was. And we had these series of rolling recessions. Texas got worse first, California got worse last, and everybody else was sort of in the middle. That's how it played out. But commercial real estate loans in Texas had always made the assumption that oil would keep going up. And I can tell you, when I was in the oil field in the early 80s, when oil hit $40 a barrel, there was this rumor that it was going to 100. They were just 25 years ahead of their time. But, you know, we thought back then, $100 oil, no problem. Now this is a monthly average, so you don't see the, the daily spikes that we saw back then. But when it really hit, the beginning of 86, oil was about $25 a barrel. Six months later, it had gone to 10, 60% drop in six months. And if that wasn't bad enough, politicians come back in and they go, well, you remember we did that 81 tax thing where you got to write it off and all that? Well, that was a bad idea. So then they took all that away. You couldn't write off losses in real estate against, and there was nothing to the equity people. What's the value of that? It's pretty much zero. So it was kind of a bad time. And to give you an idea of how it stopped, the next eight years, it took two years to get everything through the pipeline. You know, 88 is when the final build out happened. But from 88 to 96, <laughs> Dallas Fort Worth, they added five million square feet. So they went from 89 to 5. 86 to 89, capital for commercial real estate kept coming in most of the country, not necessarily Texas, I understand, but it still continued. Commercial banks, foreign investors, life insurance, pension funds kept the ball rolling for a while, a few more years. But investments started shifting into these well-occupied existing properties. People thought if you buy something with a lot of tenants, quality property, it'll work. The problem is there was so much vacant space and they could offer such deals because there was no loyalty by the tenants. And so even if you bought quality stuff, I mean, your tenants would just move and pay half the rent across the way. And then they passed FIREA. I think it's pronounced that way. FIREA, FIREA. And that created the RTC, which Reed told me there's actually people in the room who work for RTC, which is fascinating to me. I'd love to talk to you about that. And uh, that was supposed to dispose of the, it did dispose of the failed savings and loans. FDIC got rid of the failed banks. And it basically tried to push the SNLs back into the residential side of the business and away from commercial, back to housing finance specialists. Give you an idea of how bad the bank failures were. This is a 15 year period, 1980 to 95. The worst year for bank failures, bank failures was 88. 
The worst year for SNL failures was 89, kind of a tough period. And in that 15 year period, uh, the numbers I read were about 1,600 banks failed and about 1,300 SNLs failed. Late 80s to early 90s, RTC came in, uh, lasted from 89 to 95, but that was kind of a no-win situation because Congress was saying, you know, if you sold the stuff too fast, you're dumping it, destroying the market. If you sell it too slow, then you're wasting the taxpayers' money by managing it. What's wrong with you people? You can't do anything right. <laughs> I, you know, tell me if that was true or not. But that's what the literature said. And so they sold assets individually. They found they could get you know, a pretty good price if they sold them individually. But Seidman, who was head of the FDIC and RTC, I think, at that time, did a calculation and he said at the current rate, if we sell them individually, we'll get done in 120 years. So they had to come up with something better. So they went to securitized pools, they went to auctions, and got rid of it by 95 actually. But they broke new ground in this securitization, which you know some of the things that have been going on in the recent past. And people started you know, feeling pretty good about tranches, securitized loans, and things like that. They really brought that to the fore. And the number I got is that they had, uh, RTC had about 8,000 employees, but about 60,000 contractors working for them. I mean, those contractors, I have no idea how many employees they had, but we're talking a lot of people here during the gear of Early 90s, uh, recession in 1991, and then you get a credit crunch through 1992. Similar, kind of similar to what we're in today, a couple years there. Uh, you had the risk averse regulators coming back in and saying, no real estate. I don't care if it's the greatest deal since sliced bread, you will not do a real estate loan. And they were paranoid that Congress was going to call them the carpet, evidently. Uh, RTC was still unloading all their properties, and then mark-to-market accounting was really hurting the good properties as well as the bad, because everything's getting marked down. And I hear a lot of discussion about mark-to-market today, you know, be glad to talk with you about it later, but back then anyway, mark-to-market was cranking things out. Commercial real estate values dropped by a trillion dollars in three years, from 89 to 92. And by the mid-90s, securitization of the REITs and the commercial mortgage-backed securities stepped in for the banks and SNLs to provide liquidity. I mean, there was a period there, evidently, in 91, 92, where they were seeing all these real estate loans that were going to be coming up for renewal, refinancing, and they're saying, where's the credit? You know, where's, where's the liquidity? It's not there. But REITs and CMBS have stepped in. Credit crunch, crunch had become a value crunch by 93, and we've yet to see that in this turnaround, but you've got to expect that when liquidity comes back this time, and we do have money, you know, people aren't going to be willing to refinance something at 2007 values. They're going to look at today's values, and you saw the same thing back then. You know, they'd be glad to give you the money, but they're not going to work on the old prices and the old cap rates. By 94, the banks and thrifts that were left were in the best shape since the 60s, and it cost $132 billion to the taxpayer, which nowadays would feel like a rounding error. <laughs> and so the takeaways, uh, you know, in my mind, what I got out of this is the government tends to react very slowly in a crisis. And when they do react, they can often make suboptimal decisions. And I think Winston Churchill had a great line. He said, the Americans always make the right decision after they've exhausted every other option. <laughs> and so I kind of saw that.